Are you sure you want to do this? It's not what I want. It's what honor demands. So much of that scene is about what happens beforehand and building up the tension between Sansa and Arya in the earlier episodes of the season where you really believe that one will potentially kill the other. It's one of the benefits of working on a show like this where over the years so many beloved characters have been killed and so many characters make decisions you wish they hadn't that you can believe that Sansa might conspire against Arya or that Arya might decide that Sansa has betrayed the family and deserves to die. Knowing that you're aiming at that, it really helped in the writing of it because the only goal in those scenes is to build towards what feels like a real rift between them in a way that makes it extremely fraught when you get into that room with them at the end. How do you answer these charges, Lord Baelish? I was actually very interested and excited to see what Aiden would do with that moment because it's a moment he's never been in before. He's imagined every conceivable eventuality except this one. Lady Sansa, forgive me. I'm a bit confused. Whatever you want to say about Littlefinger, and he's clearly a sociopath amongst other things, he does have strong feelings towards Sansa. They're not necessarily healthy, appropriate feelings, but they are feelings towards her. And so I think he has a hard time believing that she'll be able to do this. Sansa, please. I'm a slow learner. But I learn. Unfortunately for him, he's trained her too well, and she's not about to be swayed by his tears or his pleas. Thank you for all your many lessons, Lord Baelish. You have 60 plus hours at this point of main characters who you hopefully are really invested in. It was a challenge because there are so many different ways it could go, but the fact that it was centered around the effort to persuade Cersei to stand down and to accept a truce, that gave it a spine. This isn't about living in harmony. It's just about living. There's so many different interconnections between all these people. The Hound mountain scene was one we felt we needed to highlight. Remember me. Just as Euron's not a person who's going to wait his turn, the Hound is not somebody who's going to let this person or thing or whatever he is now walk by him unchallenged, given who the mountain is to him and has been to him in his life. You know who's coming for you. You've always known. One of the themes of the season, that characters might be skeptics about religion and the supernatural, but once they confront it face to decomposing face, it's really hard to deny it anymore. I cannot serve two queens. Then there is nothing left to discuss. I don't think Tyrion goes to see Cersei out of pride or to prove that he's brave. Again, it's one of the situations where it's the only choice he can see. It's the only way he feels like he can salvage this peace mission is to go himself. He's the only person who can talk to her because as much as she hates him and as much as he hates her, they know each other better than probably anybody in the world knows them. I don't care about checking my worst impulses. I don't care about making the world a better place, hang the world. It's a little bit of a poker game they're playing there because it seems like she's bluffing and he reads her bluff, but she wanted him to read her bluff. This was all part of her game. You're pregnant. Cersei's become quite good at playing this game. She wasn't in power, but she was on the edges of power and she learned how to operate in that environment. And she plays Tyrion pretty beautifully here. The darkness is coming for us all. We'll face it together. We're in that dragon pit for many, many days. It's a deceptively difficult thing to shoot because there's so many different moments between different people and they need to be shot that way. Otherwise, it doesn't feel like anybody's looking at the person they're supposed to be looking at or playing off the person they're supposed to be playing off. We both saw what just happened. This goes beyond houses and honor and oaths. It's an interesting moment for Brienne because Brienne is so defined by loyalty, but this goes beyond that. Talk to the queen. Jamie is chosen to side with his sister. She is unequivocally bad. Everyone knows this, including Jamie. She's just trying to get him to see beyond that. And tell her what? I think that's certainly on Jamie's mind, but then the final straw is when he realizes that this was all a scam. I always knew you were the stupidest Lannister. I think seeing the truth of what's in the North, it meant one thing to Jamie, and it meant something else to Cersei. They both acknowledge the truth of it. They're both smart enough to realize what it means. 
but she is still seeing it from a cold strategic standpoint and he's seeing it from a position more of existential survival for everyone. This isn't about noble houses. This is about the living and the dead. And I intend to stay amongst the living. It's one thing to say, okay, Cersei played a trick on her enemies, but she didn't confide in him. So he's realizing that his loyalty to her is not reflected in her loyalty to him. No one walks away from me. Uh, I think that absolutely is what informs his decision to leave King's Landing. I don't believe you. He needs to know the truth. The truth about what? About himself. John's not John Sand. He's actually, as Bran finally overhears from Lyanna, Aegon Targaryen. And that means he's the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. That changes everything. I would say the challenge with this sequence was finding a way to present information that at least a good portion of the audience already had in a way that was dramatic and exciting, also had a new element to it. Part of the answer as to how to go about doing that was in the montage intercut nature of it. It was about making it clear that this was almost like an information bomb that John was heading towards. Robert's Rebellion was built on a lie. The only way to really emphasize that was to tie those two worlds together cinematically and to have Bran actually narrating these facts over the footage of John and of Danny. He's the heir to the Iron Throne. Just as we're seeing these two people come together, we're hearing the information that will inevitably, if not tear them apart, at least cause real problems in their relationship. And she's his aunt. It complicates everything on a political level, on a personal level, and it just makes everything that could have been so neat and kind of perfect for John and Danny, and it really muddies the waters. We need to tell him. We tried to contrast the various season endings so that they don't feel too similar. So last season, we had a pretty triumphant ending with Danny finally sailing west towards Westeros. This one is definitely much more horrific. Many years now, we've known this would be the ending of the penultimate season. The walls kept these things out for 8,000 years. There's no real reason that it can't keep doing that unless something puts a hole in the wall. There's one thing on the board from the beginning that is now big enough to do that, and that's a dragon. It just started to suggest itself as a logical way forward. We write, and then the wall comes tumbling down, and it's really easy to type those words on. It's really hard for them to make it look good. It to be a thing you go out of the season on. First four or five years of the show, it was the expanding universe. And as we get near the end of the show, the universe contracts. Characters are going to a place that they never have before, quite literally in some cases, but also just in a larger sense where they're facing the conflicts they know will decide their fates. The lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. Winter is here, and it's all hitting the fan from all directions.